Awesome. Uh, so the next speaker that we have is Radami Halcha, and I'll give an introduction maybe while you're setting up your <clears throat> slides and sharing screen, Radha. Um, but Radha is the Janice M. Jenkins Collegiate Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Michigan and the director of the Michigan AI Lab. And I think in the NLP community here, she needs a little introduction. Uh, she's been a past president of ACL and has organized, chaired, and spoken um, at numerous NLP workshops and conferences. Um, but I'll still give a little introduction anyway. Um, her research in lexical semantics, multilingual NLP, and computational social science has made a huge impact on our field. Uh, but to me, the biggest impact um, a researcher can have is actually how they influence and inspire other people. And I think Rada is a shining example of doing that. Uh, she's shown consistent commitment to broadening participation in computer science, leading outreach programs for our high school students, uh, the Women in Computing seminar series, the Discover CS entry level course for students without an extensive programming background to introduce them to CS and many other initiatives that have inspired and empowered hundreds of people to explore the potential of computer science. And actually, in fact, uh, I wouldn't be here working in NLP in this field today if it wasn't for Rada. Uh, she was actually my PhD advisor and the first real NLP I did was working with Rada. And so I think with her focus on both excellent NLP research and impacting and inspiring other people. I really believe Rada is one of the best people we could um, hear from today on our topic about NLP for positive impact. So thanks for being here, Rada, and take it away. Well, thanks so much for the wonderful introduction. That was a nice surprise to be introduced by former PhD student, now faculty changing the world in, in NLP. So and also grateful for um, all the organizers of, of this workshop, which includes mentees, uh, but also other people. So I, I really think it's the way forward to think big and think world scale with respect to the impact that we can have, because uh, we do, in fact, have a lot of potential as a, as a research community. Um, and I've been really inspired by the talks I've been hearing this, this morning. And um, it's it's really great to to think of what we can do in NLP. And what I want to talk about um, is ways that I've been thinking of NLP with respect to having impact on all people. And it's not necessarily that it's um, an easy route ahead, uh, but I think there are some concrete things that we've been doing as an NLP community. Um, and then there are others in which we can, um, in fact, make a positive impact um, on the world. So what I been thinking about are some of the things that we do. Um, and it's more, I structured this talk more around things that seem to be common belief um, in the NLP community. Um, and maybe we can rethink them. Um, some of these fallacies come from ways of thinking about NLP years back. And of course, things are changing. So we we'll, might as well have to change our way of approaching them. Um, and, and others come just from the state of the world changing. Um, so it's not only the way we do NLP, but just how problems are being approached and in a way also the openness that people have to interact with researchers or um, have NLP problem addressed in their communities. So one fallacy that I see often, which actually connects very closely to the talks we've just seen, um, is in general what I'm hearing from researchers, and I'm guilty of that mistake myself, thinking that the problems are known and we work on solutions. Um, and we already heard examples of that in the talk before. Um, example that I've also seen before is this um, problem of doing question answering for pregnant women. It's just coincidence. Um, it's a different in a different forum. This is in South Africa. Um, but it turns out that it's a 
period in one's life where there are lots of questions because we haven't faced that before. And so it's natural that people would seek information around. And so the immediate solution that one would think of from an NLP perspective, well, we know how to do question answering. There is plenty of data around different um, issues or situations that pregnant women would encounter. So we just run question answering system. Um, turns out that when we look at the reality in this particular community, it's not as easy as it sounds. So in South Africa, for instance, there are 11 different languages that are spoken, some of which are represented online and would have machine translation um, available, but several of them are not. So that is a multilingual setting um, with low resources. And so that's the reality of it. Even if we think, well, we know how to do question answering, um, in certain settings, it might not be um, easily workable. Here is another situation um, that's coming out from our own lab, where we were working with the um, company on analyzing customer sentiment in product reviews. So of course, as an NLP researcher, I would think, well, I know how to do sentiment analysis, so I will just take a system and apply it. Um, guess what? When we looked at real settings, so where customers actually talk about products in videos, which was the multi-model setting we are looking at, it's highly unbalanced. So although we typically think of uh, sentiment analysis in these nicely balanced data sets, 50% positive, 50% negative, in reality, it turns out to be very different. Um, and so here is another setting where, although what we think as researchers is one setup where we figure out good solutions, the reality may be quite different. And in fact, parenthetically, um, I thought it was a um, rather comic comment that we got from a reviewer. Um, there was a question like, what's the usefulness of this data set for researchers? Because researchers don't work with this kind of data which I think it was a fair comment. Researchers don't work with this kind of data, but I do believe we should more often work with real data sets. And here are some others. This is just stemming from a panel I participated two days ago on healthcare and NLP. And um, it was a medical doctor who was talking about how it's difficult to communicate information across nurse shifts in patient care. So it's really a lot of language, uh, but we don't really think about it. So if I start thinking about it, I was thinking, well, maybe it's a summarization problem, but it's not purely summarization because it's really what's important for that particular past day. So that's a reality that involves a lot of language that I personally haven't seen much done in NLP, but I think it would be something that would be highly impactful. Um, here is another one coming from the same panel um, where there are a lot of healthcare resources which are usually available on different websites. So it's an NLP problem coupled with information retrieval, how you make people aware of the kind of healthcare resources that will be, uh, will be helpful to them. Um, so this is just example that I'm seeing where there is a disconnect between um, the research we do. And again, I keep saying we because I feel I'm doing sometime at least the same thing of imagining problems and going to solve them as opposed to being closely connected to what the reality um, yeah, is. Another fallacy that um, I see quite often is this belief that NLP is one size fits all. So we build some systems, models, and then we expect them to work for everyone. And we've done some work in, um, in my lab around this. And the work, some of the work we've done was focused on word associations, which is a very fundamental task of figuring out how related words are. And here is an example, uh, which comes from the data that we collected. So the way we would go about it is we provide a prompt like cat and then ask people to think what is the first word that comes to mind, which is a reflection of the kind of semantic networks that one would have in their mind. So you can think about it. So if I say cat, what's the first word that comes to mind? I think oftentimes the answer will come as dog. 
um, other will say animal, um, other will say Tom and Jerry. So, but it's there is a um, there is a certain distribution that would be heavily toward uh, dog as the uh, the response. Now, if I ask something like sleep, um, and again, you can think for yourself was the first word that comes to mind. Usually, there is much more variation. And in fact, it turns out that this is something that was studied in, in psychology, looking back at the study that was done 100 plus years ago, uh, where they did the same task of asking people, giving a prompt, asking for what is the first word that comes to mind. And it turns out that there are differences across ages, there are differences across genders. And more recently, what we've done is replicating this study um, and also expanding with other demographic groups um, so we did the same thing and collected for 400, uh, for 300 words, we collected responses from different cultures. So this would be India um, and United States. Um, and also for, um, for different genders, ages, occupations. Um, so all in all, we collected a lot of data and asking the same question. I mean, are really people answering the same? or are there differences across groups? And as shown a hundred years ago by psychologists, we kind of found the same thing. And here is an example um, coming from the data. So if, if I have the prompt bath, and again, you can think for yourself, what is the first word that comes to mind when you say bath? We had these answers coming from people from different groups. So. If we look at the most common answer for um, male respondents in United States, they would say water. If we look for the most common answer for male respondents in India, we would see again water. Now for female respondents in India, the most common answer is soap. And then for female respondents in United States, the most common response would be bubble. And I think this illustrates just for this example, but we've seen similar things for others, is that there are differences between groups in terms of their own organization of the world, like how people would perceive the world or what are the stronger association they would have with a common concept like that. And similarly here, there are other concepts that we, um, tested for gender, for instance, for a prompt like expect, most common uh, response for a male would be nothing, for a female would be baby, or looking at locations, for a prompt like admit, most common answer for someone from India would be hospital, whereas someone from US would be guilt. Now looking at all 200,000 plus responses that we collected, um, we found similar patterns, uh, which is that there is a stronger similarity between people in the same group. So if we take, for instance, a respondent from India compared to other people from India with respect to what their response is, it's much higher than if we look at the across groups, so India versus US. So again, what this suggests is that if we were to take a simple thing such as a word embedding, which is so commonly used in NLP, it's not necessarily true that the word embedding that would be built for data drawn from American speakers would be the same as, or should be the same as for say Indian speakers. Um, as we see, there are different associations, so different neighbors that words would have in the world, English world for Indian speakers than it is for American speakers. And in fact, this is what we've done. So this is was eventually our test data for um, a model that we created for demographic word embeddings. So rather than having these generic word embeddings with the one size fits all idea that we well, it's all English, so we just have the same embeddings for all English speakers. What we've done, we added a label to the words to indicate the demographic of the speaker. So eventually we could have something that would say, this is bad as spoken by say somebody in India or as spoken by someone in US. 
And with that simple change, if we retrain these word embeddings, we ended up with representations that were now culture specific. And what we see here, this is actually fast forward a few research papers. So originally we look at one demographic at a time, and then later we also look at compositional um, demographics. So I could know, for instance, somebody's male and from India, so I can compose a representation that's more, it's closer to their perception of the world than it would be a generic representation or for example, uh, male from US. And you see here some results and these are a little bit out of context, but essentially what we do is looking at if I have given a prompt and my system using these embeddings will find the closest word, like sort of the nearest neighbors, I can measure the best response or out of 10, like top 10 responses. And you see how well we can do using these demographic embeddings versus simpler, um, simpler representations. So it's really just the starting point. There are other works, and I know from other research labs around the world as well, with this idea of demographic aware natural language processing, um, which is really challenging the notion that we had for a long time that if we build a model, say if we <laughs> keep the language, then we are good to go for. Um, any speaker of that language, which is, is really not true. Another fallacy um, that I'm seeing is that the effort that we are making in research are commensurate with needs. Um, and I know Jijing was speaking earlier today in the in-person talk about um, the alignment that we have between natural language processing and the United Nations goals. Um, and there are these 17 different goals. Um, and I don't mean to repeat what she said, it's mostly to align it with the argument that I'm trying to make. Um, it turns out from uh, the work that we've been doing that if we look at papers um, in the ACL ontology as a way of identifying how many of the, res of the research papers we work on would be aligned with these areas. Um, so these are the 5,000 papers that were um, analyzed. About 12% would be related to social good. So one question we can ask within these 12% of papers that are directly aiming to make a difference um, in the social good space, um, was the distribution across this 17 needs that were identified by the United Nations. And I believe Zijing has shared this um, website that um, we've been working on, which would map these NLP papers to the United Nations goals. And a finding there was that there are some areas where there is quite a bit of work. Uh, so for instance, um, good health and well-being. 30% of the papers being analyzed from the 12% of social good would be in good health and well being. Um, there is also a fair number on, on education or justice um, and peace. But then there are areas where there isn't really much happening. Uh, for instance, climate, there is quite a bit that we could do um, in terms of climate, uh, both with respect to understanding what are the issues faced by different. Um, countries around the world or with respect to interventions, uh, but there is really very little. And the same would be for other areas such as poverty or hunger, uh, life on land and so forth. And I believe this is an example also that Jing did, so I will not go over it, but uh, the example of poverty. Um, and of course, one would think, and that's a discussion we recently have in our lab, I mean, if you want to help poverty, you Sort of the first thing would be to give some money. And that's true, right? So that's sort of the immediate solution for poverty. But I believe there are also other ways um, in which NLP and more broadly AI could help. So it requires more thinking, more interactions with, for instance, NGOs that would be active in this space to understand where is that NLP could help. And it's not to have the presumptuous view that NLP is a solution for everything, but there are problems where we could make a difference, but we are not even attempting, maybe because 
we don't know what the actual problems are with, in the language space. Um, so having more active thinking um, could take us a long way. And so from the original map of 17 um, UN goals, we are left with a number that don't really have um, NLP efforts. I was also looking at the remaining 87%. So we could say, well, I mean, our mission is to make a difference in, in language. Um, and it's great that the number of us are thinking of social impact, but really this is not necessarily like a social science um, group of researchers. So how about the remaining 87% of the uh, papers that are not directly addressing social good? So again, I went to the ACL anthology um, and I looked at how many documents are there. So there is, according to the Google search on top of the anthology, there are 375,000 documents in the anthology. And so I did a few searches. So this is rather shallow, but I think it's illustrative in terms of the kind of interest that we have as a community. So if you search, for instance, for neural language models, you will find some 60,000 documents. Uh, if you search for fine tuning, 21,000 documents. Now, if you look for something like code switching, um, I found 4,750 documents. Now, one thing to keep in mind when we talk about code switching, and this is from Tamar Soloyo, who's been doing a lot of work in this space, 50% of the world population does code switching. So that's a form of language that a lot of us use, like one in two people would do code switching. And yet we really don't address that much in, in our work. So it will require different language models, different parts of speech tagging, different everything, because you see a mix of languages. So it's a different linguistic phenomena. Um, and yet we don't really pay a lot of attention to it. Similarly, if we look for language impairment, how much research we have here, um, I found a thousand, a little over a thousand documents in the ACL anthology. Um, and yet 7% of people have a language impairment. So again, it's a fairly prevalent phenomenon, um, but we don't necessarily pay attention. So that's the mismatch that I see between the research that we do and what are the needs out there, whether it's with respect to social good or even more broadly language phenomena. So if we think, well, we only address language, we don't want to go as far as to social impact. Even there, there is a mismatch between the attention we pay and um, the problems out there. Now, zooming in on one particular problem, um, which I've been thinking more about is syntactic parsing. And maybe some of you in, in this group haven't really done much on parsing, uh, maybe not much on pantry banks, things have changed. So this is more of the traditional kind of syntactic parsing that we've been doing for many years. Um, but what was typical there was that pantry bank, which was worked on for many years. So it was like a very intense effort from linguists to annotate carefully a corpus with this um, part of speech tags and syntactic relations. And that corpus was split into 23 sections. And so section one to 21 was used traditionally for training, section 22 for development, and then section 23 for testing. And from the perspective of, a, say, if I were to work on a project of syntactic parsing, that's a very clean setup, right? So I have separate training, development, and test, and that's what I would, I should do. Um, but now, if we look what happens over the years, so all the teams who worked on parsing using Pantry Bank use the same setup also for the purpose of comparing, which again, it's a nice side effect. Um, so eventually we reach over 90% and we kind of declare this problem to be solved that people moved away from it. There are still people working on syntactic parsing, but definitely not as many as there used to be. But really what I think that happened here is community overfitting. So it's not overfitting for individual project. Again, it was, it's a clean setup. It has separate test and development sets. But over time, we ended up overfitting to that section 23 for parsing. And the fact that we declared this problem to be solved, it might not necessarily be true. So if we were to apply the same techniques to a different data set, it might um, not necessarily work equally well. 
And finally, the, the forward fallacy, um, there is this saying, there is no better data than, um, than more data. Um, I think really the reality of the way we've been looking at it is there is no better English data than more English data. And here is a map uh, from Sebastian Ruder um, looking at different languages around the world. Um, and there are 7,000 languages and here are like different parts of the world where these languages are spoken. So a perspective that we could have at it is to what extent we have NLP on these languages. Now, some of these languages are only in spoken form. So it would be difficult to do natural language processing for a written form if there is no written form. Uh, but still with respect to what's currently being done, um, the focus is primarily on the top 100 languages. And here is a chart that shows the amount of data being available for the top 100 languages. But even among these, it turns out that a very large percentage of our research is on English. And this is a recent study, again, from Sebastian Ruder. And previously, also Emily Bender did that a couple of years before. And the numbers haven't really changed. So around 70% of the papers would address um, English. Now, looking at how much data there is, um, I think this chart is also quite insightful with respect to labeled data and unlabeled data for different languages. And the color scheme here would be going from violet all the way to red with respect to speaker population. So would be violet would be low speaker population and red would be high. So there are some languages like the red languages and the orange languages that maybe it's proportional. So how much label data and unlabeled data we have is proportional with the size of the speaker, the number of speakers in that language. Um, but others, for instance, so green would be a medium sized language and it's a large blob, which suggests that there are many languages there um, and we really don't have neither label data nor, nor unlabeled data. With respect to models, um, there have been changes in recent years, which is exciting. Um, but again, and this again, credits to Sebastian Ruder and early on to Noah Constant. Um, a lot of the models that we currently have are for English. And then there are a few multilingual models uh, like MBIRT or MT5, um, which would usually go up to those 100 languages which again, I don't mean to dismiss the effort. I think it's really impressive and it's a lot of work, uh, but also putting things at scale, it's a hundred out of 7,000. And I also found this quite interesting with respect to data annotation, which goes back to my earlier point of moving away from one size fits all. So if I were to ask you, what do you see in this image? And you can think for yourself, like if you were to write a caption for this image, what would you write? It turns out that there are differences between annotators. So for instance, American annotators will label tailgating, which is an American phenomenon to do around big sport events, to do barbecue uh, in parking lots or identifying Denver Broncos for the shirt that the man is wearing. But other annotators may not label this because they would not be familiar with this particular um, cultural uh, phenomenon. So I will conclude. Um, I think this is the space of language problems, the whole slide, if you want to imagine. Uh, there are lots of really cool language problems. We've heard about some of them, even the previous talks, and um, there is a lot to do. Uh, but I think currently as NLP researchers, we are kind of all crowding in one corner, um, sometimes even semi-stepping on each other. There is a lot of, um, there are a lot of people who would work, want to work on the same things for which we talk about state of the art and uh, really trying to work on the same problems. Whereas really, I think if we think about NLP for all, 
we would want more something like this, like people working on the different problems, um, recognizing that there aren't really that many researchers or people who would know NLP inside and out as people in this workshop and more broadly in the um, ACL community. So distributing effort a little bit more would take us closer to having NLP that's truly impactful for the whole world. And so a few highlights here based on what I've been talking about in terms of fallacy identify. I think it's important to communicate with the world and identify the real problems in need of solutions. Um, moving away from one size fits all would result into NLP models that are closer to uh, the different cultures, different beliefs that people around the world have. Um, community overfitting is actually a phenomenon. It's harder to recognize because it takes time, uh, but we've seen that. And there are many problems in NLP that have been sort of declared as solved, whereas really there is a lot more to do. And also recognizing that researchers are a scarce resource and um, we need to leverage correspondingly. I think this is a hard one uh, because eventually we are all independent. We all do what we want to do. So optimizing the research um, capability that we have in this world, I think it's it's hard. Uh, but eventually, if we put our minds together, we uh, we could do it. And credit goes a lot to my research lab. So these are the current lab members, and of course also former lab members um, who are here online. And I will stop here. I think I step over for two minutes. Um, and I'll be around for questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Rada, for a really thought-provoking talk. And I'm sure um, others have questions, but let's save those for the live Q&A session after the next talk. Um, so we'll have both speakers of the next two talks around for live Q&A. But I'll hand it over to Zhijing now for introducing our next speaker.